Good morning, everyone. My name is Dave Miller, and I'm a National Market Manager with Graybar. And I'd like to welcome you to the Graybar's G2 Talk presentation on how LED lighting can make you a warehouse rock star. This talk is part of a webinar series we offer each month. We have a great discussion lined up for you today, but before we get started, I'd like to cover a couple of housekeeping items. First of all, if you were one of the first 50 people who joined this presentation, you will receive a coupon for a free cup of coffee courtesy of Graybar as a thank you for your time today. Also, take a quick look at the bottom of the screen. You'll see a box for Q&A. Feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. We'll address as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. Lastly, our G2 Talks are all archived on the graybar.com website, so you'll be able to view the presentation again, or please recommend it to others. Today, we're happy to team up with GE Lighting. Graybar is a full-service distributor, energy product specialist, and we work alongside a GE to provide the latest lighting technology to help provide significant energy savings and ease of installation. Visit graybar.com to learn more about our solutions and our great manufacturers like GE Lighting. At this time, I'm happy today to introduce David Crow. David is a Senior Lighting Specialist at GE Lighting Institute and has been with GE for more than 30 years. He came to GE as a student co-op in HID Engineering in 1981 and then joined the company in a full-time position in 1983 after graduating with an Electrical Engineering degree from Cleveland State University. In his career with GE Lighting, David has served as a design engineer for metal halide lamps as a project leader in compact fluorescent lamps and as a product service engineer for HID lamps and ballasts. David is a member of Illuminating Engineers Society of North America, IES, and is lighting certified LC by the NCQLP. David joined the Lighting Institute staff in 2009. So without further delay, I'll turn things over to David for our presentation. Hey, thank you, David, and uh, thank you for that uh, very nice introduction. Um, I would like to uh, jump right in here uh, to the presentation and address the first topic. And the first topic, quite simply, is why LEDs? And the answer has many uh, 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 parts, but I'd like to focus in on the items that um, I have uh, on these next few slides. So. Um, as I move back to the slide, I clicked too many times. Um, LEDs are pretty much on everybody's mind. Everybody wants to know about them. They want to know how they can help save money, maybe cut maintenance. And I think that uh, in the warehouse and distribution marketplace, uh, for, those, uh, for those of you who are on the phone here, uh, we are reaching actually a peak of um, installations uh, right about uh, in the next year or so. So. Um, a study was recently uh, done, and what they found was that LEDs in high bay applications, uh, such as warehouse and distribution centers, uh, are going to be peaking at uh, 17 billion in 2017. Uh, there's a projected increase of almost 8% just this year, and we'll get those final numbers uh, hopefully in the next month or so. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, the industry uh, is adopting LEDs wholeheartedly. They realize the advantages of them, and that's one of the reasons that we're doing this presentation today um, uh, with Graybar is because we want to make sure that those of you on the phone are aware of all the benefits uh, and the fact that uh, if you haven't adopted it yet, you're pro uh, probably your neighbors have adopted it. As we look at the next slide, I've got a number of uh, items here that uh, will remind you of um, why LEDs are so popular. Uh, in a high bay application, there's a lot of uh, need for good lighting, and we need to get that light in the right place, enough of it, and not have too much glare. And what we're finding is that because of the rapid uh, adoption of LEDs, we're, we're actually being able to provide better solutions as well as lower cost and lower maintenance. So um, understood that 
cost is always probably number one on everybody's minds. What's it cost to buy this thing and what's it cost to operate it? Um, good news is prices are falling. And what's it cost to operate it? Well, it's going to cost probably a lot less than what you're paying to operate your current system. The benefits uh, are multifold, like I mentioned before, but I can just mention a few. Controllability, LEDs love being turned on and off. They don't mind uh, being dimmed. Uh, and uh, they're, they're the perfect solution uh, for implementing a control system because they're instant on and no warm-up time. You couple that with the low maintenance and the long service life, you've got a situation where it's kind of hard to deny that LEDs haven't come of age. LEDs are showing up across the industry, certainly in warehouses and in distribution centers, but really across all uh, industrial applications. And if we start adding up the amount of square footage in uh, those particular markets, uh, we find that there is over 2 billion square feet globally. Uh, and of those 2 billion square feet, 44 billion uh, actually need some kind of high bay lighting. And hopefully after this talk uh, with, uh, with myself and uh, Dave uh, Miller, uh, you'll begin to appreciate some of the advantages of LED, and maybe that will help you uh, make a choice to move that way uh, now rather than in the future. The talk is focused on uh, our, our, our guests, and thank you so much for calling in. Uh, warehouse and distribution is a, uh, a large segment of where LEDs can be used, but I just want to take a moment and digress and say that pretty much any kind of lighting source you're using today in your facility, we have an LED solution that's going to give you lower energy costs, lower maintenance costs, and essentially uh, headache-free lighting for many, many years, um, including such places as uh, office lighting, parking lot lighting, uh, indoor storage areas, um, hazardous location, um, loading docks. Uh, you can see from the picture on the screen here that all of these different areas have LED solutions that may be justified for different reasons. Some of them may be because I want to reduce my maintenance because it's so hard to get to the lamps. Others might be I want lower energy costs because I run these things 24-7. A third might be, you know what, I really need controls in this area because I feel like I'm wasting electricity running lamps 24-7 when nobody's there. So the justification can be different, but at the end of the day, the solution is all the same. LEDs are your solution for your warehouse and distribution center lighting needs. As we move into the next section here, I uh, want to just bring up some possible scenarios that you might be facing as you're thinking about moving from your old HID system to, let's say, an LED solution. My first choice uh, would be a fixture like I have shown here. It's a, a 190-watt high bay LED. You see that on the right. And that actually is going to give you equivalent light output as that old 460-watt HID uh, metal halide system. So let's just walk through some options on what you can do with this. The easiest way to save money with lighting, I think we would all agree, is to shut the lights off. But, you know, that kind of makes it hard to work in the space. So if I can um, use lower wattage and still get the same amount of light, then I have a winning formula. So in this case, the question is, well, how much light is enough? And the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America, the IES, does have recommended foot candle levels for both warehouse and storage and distribution centers. Uh, a foot candle is defined as the amount of light on a surface. In this case, it would be the surface that the forklift is driving on, which would be probably your concrete floor, or your vertical surface where you actually have boxes with labels or you have your products that are labeled in some way. So foot candles is the amount of light on a surface, be it vertical or horizontal, or actually any angle. The IES recommends 10 foot candles minimum on horizontal. That would be where the forklift would be driving. Vertical foot candles minimum five. That's where you're reading your labels. And then a contrast ratio, meaning the average to minimum brightness to darkness of not any greater than five to one. So those are the target numbers we want to hit 
to meet industry standards. So let's look at that a little closer with this 400 watt metal halide versus the LED that we're thinking about putting in. What we did was we created two virtual reality warehouse spaces with shelving. Ceilings were 33 uh, feet tall, racks were 28 feet tall. Uh, we put an aisle between the racks and we put three fixtures in. This was all done in AGI 32, and what we found through many years and literally thousands of these design iterations is that the numbers we get in AGI 32 as predictors actually show up in real life when we go out to the space after it's built and measure it with an actual light meter in your hand. So I feel the numbers we'll be pre uh, presenting here are very real and reproducible in your site. So we did an HID simulation and then we did an LED simulation. And notice that I used a very tight lens on the 55, on the LED, a 55 degree lens. That allows me to put the light where I want it and not have a lot of light spilling all over the place which the HID does because I don't have that kind of optical control. As we move on and actually look at the light levels that we measured in this computer simulation, we find out that both situations do meet the 10 foot candle minimum on horizontal foot candles, but you'll notice in the center, the vertical foot candles, which is very, very important in a warehouse where I need to find product quickly on shelving, be able to read labels, be able to get barcodes, I need to be able to find those products quickly so I can uh, uh, run an efficient business. The vertical foot candles on the HID installation actually fail the IES minimum. They're actually less than four foot candles where the spec is five foot candles minimum. The LED on the other hand actually exceeds the, the IES recommendation at almost six foot candles vertical. And contrast ratio, average foot candles, the minimum foot candles, uh, both systems do meet less than five to one. So if you're running that old HID, you may not be meeting industry standards today and you don't even know it. What we can, get, what we can do is we can come in and evaluate what you've got. We can evaluate what we think you need and we can come to an understanding uh, on uh, what is the proper lighting for you and for your workers so that they can uh, do their jobs more effectively and more safely. I've blown up the pictures here from the computer simulation, and I want to focus your attention on the floor area between the shelves. And if you look closely at your computer model, you'll notice that the floor for the HID version is very modeled. There's a bright spot and then a dark and a bright and a dark. That is probably what you've got in your warehouse today. You'll notice the picture below it with the LED improvement. The light is extremely uniform. And also the light on the shelves is actually extending deeper into the shelves because you know what? Sometimes those boxes aren't right on the edge. Sometimes they're kind of pushed in. If I can get more light reflected off the floor, if I can put more light on those vertical surfaces, it's going to help my workers be more effective and make me have a more effective business. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Dave Miller, and he's going to talk about an actual application. It's all yours, Dave. Thanks, David. Hey, you know, that's a great point. The boxes are never up front, and having light that goes well deeper into your shelf just helps us all scan and read those labels. So, Graybar, although we're a sponsor here today of this G2 Talk, we also operate warehouses for a living, just like you. We know what this is. We have been upgrading our warehouses to HID over the years, then fluorescent over the years, and now LED. So let's take a look. In our warehouse in Hayward, California, it's a 132,000 square foot distribution center. We're pretty efficient. We have got six lamp T5HO fixtures in there. Each fixture is about 350 watts each. As you're looking at these images, um, well, first of all, I hope this is the outbound side of our warehouse because I really like to think that all of those boxes are heading out towards our customers right now. Good for business. But the fact is that each fixture is consuming 350 watts, and you can also see in the ceiling, we've got some skylights in there. So then let's flip to the renovated slide. So in this image, what we've got is the same 132,000 square feet. We've got new LED 267 watt fixtures that one for one replaced 
the existing T5HOs. Our payback is 2.2 years after utility rebate. That's huge. Really nice upgrade after only upgrading a handful of years ago to the T5HO fixtures. So much brighter, better illuminance, reaches far deeper into the racks. If you want, take a quick look down and look at the statistics. Remember what Dave said about the IES standards? Our horizontal in the aisles is 20-foot candles, the staging area 30-foot candles. Vertically, we've got 5 and 14. So much brighter, much more usable light. As we all know, light and bright equals clean and safe. OSHA has shared there's over 100,000 forklift accidents a year, and we want to exceed those levels to make sure that our folks are seeing everything as well as seeing our, our people, right? As Graybar, we've actually reduced our electrical spend by $9.6 million over the last decade. So now is a great time to upgrade to, uh, to LED. So Dave Caro, um, you know, there's a lot of options out there. How can you help us decide what the best solutions are for our applications? Yeah, I'm glad you asked me that, Dave, and it's something that uh, we've given a lot of thought to. And what I'd like to present now is a good, better, best scenario that hopefully logically can take you from where you are today to a better solution. And we're where we want to start is once again with the Illuminati Engineering Society and a new guideline that they just published. Um, it's LEM3, which means Lighting Energy Management Number 3. That's actually the technical number of the document. The title is Upgrading Lighting Systems in Commercial and in Institutional Spaces. And they open up this document with, I think, a really good question. Why do I need to improve my lighting? I like my lighting. I've gotten used to it. I know the problems. I know how to fix it. Um, why would I do that? Well, here's eight really good reasons to consider updating your lighting. Um, you've got old technology. Back in July of 2012, T12 fluorescent tubes uh, became much, much harder to get. Uh, the standard ones pretty much went away. We still have very expensive ones that you can buy. But that is an obsolete technology. Likewise, metal halide, which has served the distribution warehouse market lighting needs literally for decades, that is now considered obsolete because of LED. How about light levels too low or glare problems or problems with lenses? Um, what about uh, the need of operators having higher light levels uh, than they've needed before uh, or dimming the lights in the back or shutting the lights in the back of the warehouse or distribution center where I don't need all that light all the time because I'm only accessing those parts of the building uh, three, four times a day. So maybe shut the lights off back there or dim them, you know, for safety reasons. I don't want them off. Um, the other thing is that uh, so something that we have pushed uh, in retail and in uh, institutional lighting and in office lighting uh, is something called layers of light. So the thought is instead of lighting my entire facility at one light level, I would rather light it to a lower general light level, like along hallways and other access areas, which is totally safe and within uh, industry standards, but where I need more light in order to get whatever the job is done effectively, that's where I put in an extra layer of light to add to the ambient light, and then those add, and those give me the light level targets I need for whatever job needs to be done in that specific place. So I put high light levels where I need it, but not where I don't need it, and I provide a general ambient light everywhere else. It's a way of lighting your warehouse or distribution more effectively and more efficiently, cutting your electrical load, but not decreasing in any way the ability to do the job in that space. As we move to the next slide, what I want to do is go through the good, best, good, better, best scenario. So if I'm looking at just simply wanting to do my quickest HID to LED solution, what I might choose to do would be to take my old HID fixture, and in this case it would be a 400 watt metal halide, and I now have commercially available 400 watt LED replacement light bulbs. In this case, I do no rewiring on my fixture. 
I simply unscrew that old glass metal halide 400 watt light bulb and I screw in the exact same socket, the LED replacement. Instantly, I go from a 460 watt load on my line down to a 200 watt load. I also reduce my energy from $220 a year to light that fixture to less than $100 a year to light that fixture. And you'll notice I'm assuming about 12 hours a day and 12 cents a kilowatt hour. We can adjust this for your own uh, personal or uh, application. The other thing that I think is really important to point out is the fact that the HID lamps at 50, uh, they'll have 50% failed in about five years. Okay, so you can, you can assume half of them are burned out at rated life, which is 20,000 hours. On the LED screw-in replacement light bulb, I have essentially no failures in 12 and a half years. Okay, so I more than double the usable life and I decrease the failure rate to essentially zero with the LED. You might agree this is a good choice. Now what's the downside? The downside is I can't dim it. Oh, I thought LEDs were dimmable. Well, you don't have a dimmable ballast in your old fixture, so it's not dimmable. Um, it's open only, so open fixture only. If you have an enclosed fixture, you can't use this light bulb because it's going to run too hot. Um, it is universal burn position, so if you got base up, base down, horizontal, it's good. Also, this light bulb is only rated for indoors, so you can't use it outside like you might have uh, in the past, maybe in a parking lot. So, yeah, it's got a lot of wonderful features, but I'm relegating it to the good category because you know what? I got something better to show you. The better option would be, once again, a one-for-one, one, so I'm not changing any wiring in my ceiling. I've got the old HID fixture. I literally drop it to the ground, and I'm done with it. And for every one I take down, I put up a single LED fixture like the one I have shown here. I'm now giving you little bit better option on electricity, okay, instead of, a, uh, instead of $96 a year, this one's only going to cost you $91 a year for electricity, but notice what I did to the life. I went from uh, 12 and a half years to 25 years with essentially no failures, and this one is dimmable, so I can now put controls on this. So going from good to better gives me not only significantly longer life, like a factor of two, it also presents the option of being able to have controllable optics. It gives me um, controllability. Okay, so uh, I'm kind of liking this as a better option. Now, honestly, I couldn't jump right to best because I had another idea for you. And the other idea goes like this. If you are willing to rewire your ceiling or, you know, like in a major renovation or in new construction, if I still use that old 400-watt base as a 400 watt baseline uh, example, if I'm, if I'm okay with actually redesigning my wiring, I can now take down my 400 watt and actually put up fewer LED fixtures and still get usable light. In fact, I actually get better light. In this case, what we're finding is, and the IES is uh, finding, is that with LED fixtures, we can oftentimes reduce the total count in a major redesign or a major retrofit uh, by up to 20%. So now instead of taking one fixture down, putting one fixture up, I take 10 fixtures down, I put eight fixtures up. That's going to help your bottom line on your investment. It is also going to reduce your maintenance because you don't have to worry about 20% uh, fewer fixtures. They're also, of course, controllable. They've got the energy savings, and there's your 25-year life. So that's why I've got this even better option, uh, which would require uh, redesign. The best option is kind of a combination of everything you probably uh, are thinking already. So the best requires a redesign, which means take down 10 fixtures, put up 8 fixtures, but now include controls. And with controls, I get an additional 20% savings. So at the end of the day, I now can go from a 460-watt system, my old HID, down to a 122-watt LED system, give you your 25 years life at 4,000 hours a year with controllability, which is now the best option I can give you. I know that's a lot to think about, and I know I went quickly. So what I've done is I've summarized these four options on this slide. So you can see them all side by side the good, the better, and the best. 
and the, the top two are for a replacement option. Take one down, put one up. Okay, no rewiring. Option three and four is going to require rewiring, but it gives you 20% fewer fixtures. Typically, we'd have to do an actual layout to tell you what your savings would be. And with option four, we not only have reduced the number of fixtures, but we've also uh, added controls. Now, if you're thinking about savings, boy, you know, that first one looked really good up front, 56% savings. That's pretty darn attractive. But wow, look at the savings on option four. Option four is giving you 73% energy savings. Now, this is a projected energy savings. Obviously, I'd have to do this actual lighting layout for you in your uh, facility to tell you what your actual savings would be. But this is all, uh, these estimates are done with good engineering judgment. And uh, this is certainly ballpark. This is what you could get with these uh, different options. So LEDs are flexible. I guess that's what I want you to take away from this. We can get you in a, into LEDs at a 56% um, energy rate or energy savings rate, or I can get you in uh, at a 73% or something in between that. Um, once again, it's up to you and what your budget is and what you're willing to do regarding your facility and uh, rewiring it. Let me talk about controls next. I've um, mentioned that um, getting controls into your system can give you uh, considerable savings. And let me just talk about some of those. Now, the simplest control is going to be an on-off switch. It's going to be a breaker in a lighting panel. Uh, it's going to be a light switch on a wall. It might be a manual dimmer that's been installed on a wall that you can control a certain zone in your building or maybe a certain zone on the floor. Um, what I'm proposing here is to go with hardwired controls. So uh, instead of having us, you know, the people that are working in the space actually manipulating the controls and trying to get some advantage, what I'd really like to propose is putting in automatic controllers that make sense for your facility. And one of the areas that we're finding the greatest um, benefits with controls is with daylight harvesting. So what's that mean? What that means literally is using the sun coming in through windows and skylights to actually add to the lighting in the space, which now allows me to reduce my electrical load with the free sunlight. So being able to harvest that sunlight and with different techniques like light shelves and other things that we could actually look at for your facility, we can actually push that light farther in to the room, further in from that outside wall where the window is. And that coupled with photo cells would then allow the lamps or the fixtures in your ceiling to automatically dim but still maintain the minimum foot candle level, light level, down at the floor where y'all are working. Okay, so the thought is, if the light from the window is coming in and it's free, why wouldn't I use that to supplement my electric load and therefore allow me to dim my lights? What the IES is finding is that you can actually drop your electrical loads 30 to 70% with daylight harvesting, which is pretty amazing. So if you have a building with windows and other um, skylights and other uh, light transmitting surfaces in your building, something to really, really look at. And with LEDs, because they love to be dimmed and love to be turned on and off, you not only are getting all the energy savings, but you're doing absolutely no harm of any kind to the LED or to the driver, because they really don't mind being dimmed or turned on and off. Now, in addition to the daylight harvesting, I would then recommend traditional controls such things as occupancy sensors, vacancy sensors, some type of motion detectors in various areas in your distribution centers and uh, warehouses where you're literally turning the lights on only when people are in the space and dimming them when they're not or shutting them off when they're not. And when the sensors are placed properly, we call that commissioning, chosen properly with the right lensing, we can put sensors in high bay applications, and we can control individual aisles, sections of aisles, where if you have very long runs of, of uh, shelving, we could have two or three sensors on it, and when a forklift comes into that aisle, maybe the first 30 feet would be lit. If they proceed down that aisle, 
then the next sensor kicks in and now you've got 60 feet lit and so on and so on so it can be done segmented whatever makes sense for your application the electronics are there today we then couple in wireless technology where the sensors wouldn't have to have wires run to them because the sensors are built right into the fixtures and communication is actually through the air with something that's similar to Wi-Fi typically it's like a Zigbee kind of a communication indoors and that now allows you to control the fixtures from an on off and from a dimming standpoint either with controls or let's say you want to turn your lights on in your factory um, in Kansas City and you're sitting in Cleveland you can actually get on the computer and since your system is tied into the internet and it's wireless, you don't have to run any wires to your fixtures, turn them on and off, you can now control your fixtures from anywhere in the world as long as you've got a computer that's connected to the internet. I mean, this is pretty extraordinary capability. Once the fixtures are on, then your controls are the ones who dictate whether they're dimmed or at full brightness, depending on the motion in the space. So that kind of controllability, that kind of predictability, now allows you to better budget and understand how your lighting is going to actually be uh, consuming energy. So don't ignore controls. Honestly, with legislation that's going across the United States, uh, we're coming to the point now where we're not going to have a choice. We're going to have to use controls. Uh, if you live in California, you know what I'm speaking of with Title 24. Um, my thought is, why wait for the legislation? Why not get my 20, 30, 40% energy savings with daylight harvesting and, and, uh, and uh, motion detectors today? Why do I have to wait to be told to do it when I know that I can do it today and get all the benefits from it? So something to consider, and uh, I please, uh, please always include a controls discussion with any kind of a lighting upgrade, either indoors or outdoors. With that, I'm going okay. to turn it back to David. And David, can you tell us about uh, how we can reduce that uh, higher cost on fixtures? Uh, what's one way to do that? Absolutely, David. Thank you. And again, thank you for uh, not only sharing the IES standards, helping us understand what those options are, and getting us some real evaluation points that we can use as we look at the, uh, the various uh, different solutions that are out there. Um, Going forward, there are a uh, there's a lot of questions that come up when you start doing a, uh, a proposal like this and, and looking at a project. Uh, as managers of warehouses, folks who run them, uh, projects like this can really represent a disruption to the business, right? So let's try and take this apart to make it a little bit more bite-sized and make it easier. So first of all, Graybar has distilled this down to a fairly simple four-step process. We're doing it for ourselves, and we're going to bring that knowledge to our customers. First thing we do is have a, an in-person discussion with you. We'll come out, take a look at the facility that exists. We will look at the fixtures that are there, the lighting, your current lighting systems, control systems if they're there. And based on what you have existing in the space and an initial evaluation of lighting standards, it makes it pretty easy to have a preliminary discussion about what the project could look like. So that becomes then our assessment. If you as a customer are interested in taking that next step, we will come in with a professional software. We will do an assessment of the facility. We'll look at the fixtures. We will take the actual wattages. We'll take lamps, verify what the wattage is per fixture, how many of each type there are, We'll look for things like your electric bills. We'd love to have 12 months, figure out what demand charges are, kilowatt hour rates, have that actual data that we both need to depend on. Then we'll go back and make a design recommendation. The design recommendation, is, as Dave said, really is not as simple as you've got this, here's what we would suggest for you. Some of the factors that go into that design recommendation obviously are a good, better, even better, and a best scenario. You have multiple choices, and it's our job to make sure that you're aware of those choices and then what the implications are. Next thing is that uh, in that HI, excuse me, in that upgrade design, we have to take into effect 
factors such as how long does it take to install a fixture? How easy is it to retrofit? What does the utility uh, prefer in terms of rebates? And then also, what different applications are there for standards? Think Title 24. All of that comes into the design recommendation. At that point, we'll build a solution or a handful of solutions for you and come back with a CFO level proposal. It'll not only get into the technology and the benefits of greater lighting, but it'll also provide the dollars, uh, the specific payback, ROI. Uh, we will provide the various metrics that an owner would want, a manager of the P&L, or a CFO in order to evaluate the financial metrics. So there's two different angles, right? First is quality of light and its impact on your facility, and the second is the economic impact on your facility. And then the third metric is the maintenance aspect on your facility. We'll help you understand and have exact data on all three of those. So if you like what you see and you want to move ahead, we'll begin project management. At that point, if you have a contractor who you believe in and want to do the work, great. If not, we know some good local contractors and we can make recommendations for folks to install the fixtures. We can also help you recycle the existing fixtures and lamps and ballasts. Third of all, if this just doesn't really match your CapEx cycle, we have Graybar Financial Services. The job of Graybar Financial Services is to help provide a lease structure so that you go cash flow positive day one. And knowing what those rebates are from the utilities, if they do exist, we factor all of that in so that you've got a simple, clear to understand financial proposal as well as know where your um, ROI is going to end up. Lastly, uh, we did mention utility rebates. Uh, Graybar will go out and work on your behalf to obtain those, identify and obtain those rebates. And then, after the job, we'll help you understand and measure savings. There's a couple ways to do it. First is simply the wattage, old fixture, new fixture. But if you'd like, we can provide metering that will give you exact output. That's possible as well. So let's dig a little bit deeper into rebate capture. This is often 10, 20, 30 percent of the expense of an entire project. So right now, utilities and many utilities across the United States are collecting fees for many of their commercial customers, and that fee goes into a fund which is then redispersed among those users of that utility as a energy upgrade. So in this particular case, this utility will offer an energy incentive upgrade for a certain amount of kilowatt hours reduced. As Graybar, our team knows what those utility incentive programs are. We're in contact with them. We're often a trade ally. And we will not only look for the rebate that's the most effective for you and your facility, but also utilities tend to have specifications around what solutions get chosen. So what you and I are both looking for is a solution that is not only easy to install, it's the solution that's going to give you the lighting that you need for your facility for safety, for security, for efficiency, but then also it's going to be the fixture and solution that that utility is going to pay the maximum rebate on. So it's a little bit more complex than it initially appears, but the good news is we will help you identify the right solution, help work with you to file the paperwork, and then capture that rebate. So it's a very important part of the overall solution. Okay, let's jump into the questions phase. So during the last few minutes, a number of great questions have come in. And let's start with uh, the first one, Dave, uh, David Corot. So back to option number one. A uh, question came in, doesn't the ballast still create load? and the lamps required to use the ballast in the HID fixture for that example. So um, that's that 200-watt lamp in a 
400 watt HID fixture with a ballast that consumes a total of 458 watts. Yeah, very, very good question. And um, let me explain that. Yes, the, the ballast does always cause a load because it's not 100% uh, efficient. So total disclosure, the light bulb, the HID LED replacement, so that, that LED light bulb that we're proposing you put in your socket, the light bulb itself actually runs at 165 watts, and then the ballast losses are another 35. So that's how I get to 200 watt system on the LED option versus 460 watts on the uh, old metal halide. So it is an apples to apples. It is system versus system. Uh, lamp 165 and the old HID ballast is going to run about 35 watts. It's going to depend on the ballast you have, so your energy savings may vary, but this is ballpark. So it's going to give you that, that, that kind of level of savings. More than uh, half, half your power most likely will be saved. Okay. And then Tyler asks, what are the model numbers of those replacement lamps? How do you find them easily? Well, once again, good question. Uh, for for the GE website, uh, we'd ask you to go to uh, www.led.com. So light emitting diode, led.com. That is going to give you access to all the part numbers and all the products that we talked about today. Absolutely. We'll also have a link on our page back over there as well and have those particular options shown. So, uh, David, do LED fixtures have color shift? Right now, the industry is still relatively young, and what we're finding is that the key metric that is going to be a life-determining metric is lumens, and that's why the industry is still focused on an L number. So we give you an hours and then like L70 or L85, and we as an industry have, have agreed that lumens is your life limiting factor. Now, if a fixture is run past rated life or even during rated life, certainly there could be some color shift. And the extent of that is um, literally being learned as we burn these fixtures out past our test period. And um, it is possible. It's absolutely possible. And is it life limiting? Once again, it depends on the application and how severe the color change is. But um, the industry is looking at that, but honestly, we don't have it quantified yet. Okay. And then actually, we had a, a similar follow up question. What are the color options for LED fixtures? Well, the beauty of LEDs is they can have pretty much any color we want. So what I'm seeing typically for high bay industrial, so warehouse distribution center, is you're going to have 3,000, 4,000, and 5,000 Kelvin, probably within that range. Uh, probably the most uh, uh, familiar to, to, to you would be 4,000 Kelvin, um, because that's just about where a 400-watt metal halide is. Okay. Um, oh, interesting angle. Can uh, these fixtures... Uh, like the Albio, be used outdoors? Okay, um, the answer is some of them, not all of them. Um, be very careful with the specification sheets. What you want to look for is an IP rating on the fixture. If the fixture is rated IP65 or IP66, then it can be used outdoors. If it has no IP rating at all, then it most likely is a damp and dry application uh, fixture, which means uh, indoors only. Okay, thank you. Um, now let's go back indoors. So the question is, is there a wireless control available for LEDs indoor? I know you touched on that, but can you talk a little bit more about wireless and how that works? Yes. Um, as we move into a world where controllability is going to become something that's standard. Um, for as much a reason as it saves energy as we're forced to do it because of legislation, uh, wireless control is going to be the preferred option because there's no additional cost for installation. I don't have to pull those low voltage wires 
and in uh, industrial situations, those low voltage wires have to be in conduit, so it does add a lot of cost. So wireless indoors becoming the standard. Um, the way it works is similar to the way Wi-Fi works in your home or in your office. Uh, you've got uh, uh, Wi-Fi uh, units in, installed in various places in the building, and they pretty much blanket the area. And as long as your fixture can connect to that uh, local Wi-Fi hub, then it's going to be connected to the Internet. And there's different communication protocols that are specified by the IEEE. Uh, some are going to be higher security than others. Uh, others are going to have uh, the Internet part actually part of the wireless protocol, or uh, in others it's actually something that's added. So uh, you got to get into the detail, but at the end of the day, it's going to give you a low-cost installation because there is no additional cost for wiring or, or uh, installation, uh, and give you controllability up to including um, monitoring power, dimmability, on-off, and I guess whatever else uh, regarding intelligence we can put in the fixture. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, there's three or four questions that are coming in all around the same topic, uh, measuring foot candles. Uh, how do you measure horizontal? How do you measure vertical? Uh, what about the apps that you get on the iPhones or regular phones? Uh, would you get into measurement of uh, uh, light levels? Uh, absolutely. Thank you uh, for that question. Foot candles are what you're buying. Okay, I mean, at the end of the day, you're buying foot candles. You need to have a certain amount of light on surfaces so that the job can be done in that space. And to be able to monitor initial foot candles and how foot candles change is something that's important to you as business owners and business operators. Um, simple foot candle meters can be bought uh, at Graybar. And for indoor light levels, those are going to be quite adequate, typically, uh, for measuring vertical and horizontal foot candles. Uh, there was a mention about iPhone, I'm picking on iPhone, sorry, picking on uh, apps, uh, regardless of who the, uh, the uh, provider is. Um, those are going to be, some are good, some are not so good. I've seen some that are pretty accurate, others that are not. Um, if you are uh, in the business, and this is something that is part of your livelihood, I would recommend buying a real illuminance meter, uh, one that is uh, calibrated, one that has cosine correction, which means that if the light's coming in at uh, anything other than 90 degrees straight into the sensor, it's going to correct for that angle. Um, using your cell phone is uh, going to be, if anything, uh, tenuous and probably not very predictable. Uh, foot candles horizontal um, would be typically for indoors is 30 inches off the ground is the standard height. In an area where you're running forklifts, you would actually measure your horizontal foot candles on the concrete, actually where your people are walking and your equipment is moving. Uh, so literally on the ground, you'd put your foot candle meter. And for vertical foot candles, uh, I arbitrarily chose five feet. Uh, so all the numbers I put in the presentation uh, were the foot candle measures uh, from my uh, software at five feet. Honestly, you measure your vertical foot candles where you need to read the labels. So if you've got boxes three feet off the ground, five feet, 10 feet, 20 feet off the ground, and you've got to read labels, that's where you would measure your vertical foot candles. Okay, thank you. And then uh, there's a, uh, a question along the same lines, uh, actually a, a guy I know from uh, the past, Leo. Uh, is asking about uh, the difference in um, lumens uh, from an HID fixture versus LED. And can you also talk a little bit about the new um, color um, um, recommendations from IES um, and how that's going to play LED versus other uh, color quality uh, measurements? Yeah, I, I know there's confusion. There's There certainly is a, a lot of chatter about uh, lumens from LEDs can't be measured with a standard foot candle meter, and, and um, you know, there's that, that kind of talk. Uh, from an from a engineering standpoint, from an IES standpoint, uh, there is only one lumen that is defined, and it's actually defined as a function of how you see color. So it's tied back to the human vision system. 
and it is uh, it's defined. It's what all of the foot candle meters that you buy in the industry are going to be calibrated to. It's called the V lambda curve. It's the uh, the photopic um, curve that defines standard human vision uh, for an average person. So lumens are lumens are lumens, uh, and the lumens measured from an LED is going to be a number. Lumens from an HID is going to be a number, and since there's only one lumen, that is the number. Um, where we start running into some problems is if we have a inexpensive foot candle meter that may not be calibrated very well in the low wavelength, or I should say in the short wavelength um, re region, which is blue and purple. LED fixtures uh, with white light typically start out with a blue or purple LED, so there's going to be a lot of those wavelengths in the spectrum. If the meter is not calibrated to capture those shorter wavelengths, which are still visible to the human eye, uh, that meter is going to give you inaccurate values. Uh, once again, this is why I recommend buying a good foot candle meter uh, from Graybar, uh, one that is traceable back with uh, calibration. Um, as far as color standards go, there has been yeah, right. an issue. Yeah, there's been an issue with color standards, specifically as Dave just mentioned, color rendering index. Uh, probably pretty much since um, the 1930s when we started introducing fluorescent lamps, um, because now suddenly the standard, which was based on incandescent as the best uh, and the sun as the best, uh, now didn't necessarily, necessarily make a lot of sense when you have different light sources like HID or fluorescent or LED. Um, so there has been a proposal by the IES for a new color standard, uh, but it has not been adopted by the industry. It is simply a proposal. Uh, honestly, there's been a lot of proposals. And what we've got today is color temperature, uh, CCT, correlated color temperature, uh, which tells you the shade of white that a white wall would be. It tells you nothing about the other colors of the spectrum, just what white's going to look like. And then there's color rendering index, which is a standard that goes back to the 1930s that was actually developed in Europe. And those are the two standard color metrics that are used today. And uh, since these metrics only change when there's industry consensus across the entire world, um, it's going to take a little time for something new to show up. Okay. Then um, jumping back to that uh, HID, like an HPS fixture, one of the questions came in, do you have a retrofit um, that would be appropriate for uplighting an outdoor application that's currently an HPS mogul-based lamp? So a couple implications within that question. Yeah, so uh, you're talking about uh, uplighting. Uh, so you need something that's probably horizontal. Uh, and it's high pressure sodium, so you've got a high pressure sodium ballast. And right now, uh, speaking uh, for GE, uh, the only retrofit lamp that we have, is, number one, is open fixture, and that outdoor uh, uplight's probably enclosed. Um, it, the, the only offering we have for an LED screw and replacement lamp for HID is for metal halide. Uh, M59, M135, and M155 ANSI ballasts. So if you have one of those three types of ballast in your fixture and your fixture is open, then you can use that screw and replacement lamp. It is not suitable for high pressure sodium ballasts at this point. Okay, we've got LED fixtures for that then. Um, another one came in. Is, um, is there a fixture that's a good application for a 10-foot ceiling? LED. Uh, we, yeah, we would, we would not use the high bay in that. Uh, we would use what we call low bay, and there are a number of excellent options for a 10-foot ceiling. If it's a drop ceiling, uh, we would certainly have troughers and surface mount fixtures. If it's an open truss kind of a commercial area, uh, we have many different LED fixtures that would be perfect for a 10-foot ceiling uh, that would hang on chains or cables or conduit or threaded rod. 
that would uh, replace your existing fluorescent that you most likely have uh, 10 feet off the floor? So the answer is yes, and gray bar can certainly help you with that. And if you just want to look uh, at LED.com, uh, you'll find a lot of different options on that website. Okay. Um, next question, Matthew wants to ask a couple questions about DC. So what, what is your opinion about uh, powering LED lighting from DC versus AC? Obviously, there's a handful of uh, applications such as a UPS or a, uh, you know, a PPV solar array that uh, might make it a little bit more interesting. Well, I, I, you know, I'm thinking uh, Thomas Edison is smiling when you ask that question. So uh, thank you for asking that question. Um, LEDs are a DC device, so I can simplify the driver if I start with a DC source. So if I'm starting with solar panels or with batteries, I've already got a DC source. Now I just have to adjust its current and make sure the voltage is proper so we can run the LEDs. Uh, I'm thinking of an automobile. More and more cars on the road you're going to see uh, with LED headlights. Uh, I'm seeing many of them now. Uh, LED brake lights and then all the lights inside the car, the dome light and the, and the dashboard light and the courtesy lights. Everything's ending up LED. Well, why is the automotive industry uh, just kind of wrapping their rounds around LEDs? That's because cars have batteries in them, and they've got a very readily available, very hard line uh, battery sitting under the hood of the car that can power all the lighting needs in that entire vehicle. Um, as we start putting more and more LED systems into buildings, uh, we will undoubtedly start putting LED systems on DC lines that are actually run in the buildings, and uh, that's going to reduce the amount of electronics needed to take the AC to DC because the DC is uh, right there in the wall. So good question, and yes, LEDs only run on DC, and if you can put more DC available for them to plug into, then they'll work, and that's why they're so popular in cars. Okay, thank you. Mark, I, uh, I saved your question for last because it's a great transition. So Mark asks, hey, back to that uh, uh, four-step chart, what's the cost for each step? What's deliverables? So uh, I, I just say, as Graybar and GE, our goal is to help you upgrade to a great quality LED system, right? So we'll come out, have a conversation with you. And uh, we're not going to charge you for that. Same thing with the assessment, the proposal. We'll build this together in good faith as two business folks working together to, to do the right thing. So at that point, the deliverables are a uh, design recommendation around fixtures that are appropriate for your facility and in harmony with any uh, local laws, requirements, and uh, designed to take the, the utility rebate incentive into effect. So our goal is to get you a solution that's going to work well and provide you the best ROI and the best lighting output. There's no charge for that. It's simply a good faith business proposition. So having said that, uh, next steps. If you're interested, shoot us an email or come download the guide of a brighter future for your warehouse, and then also fill in your VIP pass, uh, www.graybar.com. On there, we've also got information on energy costs, maintenance, safety. So graybar.com, applications, energy solutions, Rockstar Warehouse. If you visit the warehouse site, we'll respond back to you as well there. There's a couple of folks who um, have more specific questions we didn't get to regarding uh, effects on uh, uh, patients in a medical application, et cetera. We'll get back to those specifically via an email. So then, on behalf of Graybar and GE, just want to say thank you for attending today and hope you really have a happy holidays. David, any last closeout comments? Uh, thank you, David. And I also want to thank Graybar for giving us this opportunity to present with, uh, along with you. And hopefully uh, the folks on the phone found this beneficial. Uh, I know I enjoyed talking about it. I hope you enjoyed listening to us. 
Um, and David, uh, thank you so much again, and uh, happy holidays, everybody, and I hope to do this again soon. Okay. So long, folks. Signing off.